I want to go back over something real quick with you, and then we'll get right into the book of Revelation. Come, if you will, to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 9. Apparently, this seemed to uh, help some people, and uh, I guess, contrary to what modern-day uh, teaching is, uh, under grace, there's nothing forced. Uh, modern-day teaching teaches that everything that you do, especially with, uh, with sometimes with independent Baptists, is everything you do is connected with people's perception of your spirituality. Your spirituality is determined in Galatians chapter number 5, how much fruit of the Spirit do you see? Amen. So if you want to know if you're spiritual, you go read through Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, you'll see the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. Let's just turn there real quick. Father, pray you bless your word this morning. Pray, God, that you'll help us as we go through these things. And thank you, Lord, for being back home. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. All right, Galatians chapter number 5. Look at this now. Now, this is what you want to do. And you'll notice in this list of things, uh, there's no uh, 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 fruit called uh, inspection. No, nobody in here has the, the gift of being able to determine who's spiritual and who's not. If Christians could get a hold of that, you'd stop being, you would stop be, being so disappointed in everybody not being what you think you already are. Because really, you're already becoming the measuring stick. And what happens is, is that when everybody doesn't come up to your expectation, then you think, well, they're not spiritual. Because you have expectations that they should be doing this, they should be doing this, and they should be doing this. But you have no way of determining spirituality by what you see on the outside. In the old time, what they used to call hard shell Baptist, which came out of the, uh, the holiness movement, the Pentecostal movement, said... If you're saved, then we can see on the outside or determine that you're saved because we see, and then they make a list of things. For them, it was the women wear their hair up in a bun and because they had it down in the middle of their back. They never would cut their hair or anything like that or three-quarter length sleeve or dresses down uh, you know, below the knee and that kind of a stuff. If you're Amish or if you happen to be a Mennonite, then the shirt stays buttoned up all the way to the top and the sleeves stay buttoned and you don't wear lace up, I mean, uh, uh, you have to wear lace up shoes but not the kind that have the button and hook on them. Remember the old days of the old brogans where you get to the top few buttons where you would just throw it around a hook? Well, they actually had a church split over the fact that there were some of the guys that were getting brogans and the brogans that they worked with had, they get to the top last three or four things and the, they laced around the hook instead of going through the buttonhole. And they determined that they were outcasts and unspiritual because they were looking for an easy way around things. I'm not kidding you. It's, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Well, the thing you have to fight as a Christian is, is that the temptation is, is to always be looking at what somebody else is doing to determine spirituality. Paul says you examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Amen. He nowhere says for you to look at everybody else. The other thing he tells you is, is in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, he says that for you to judge yourself, if a man examine himself. So you're supposed to be a self-examiner. And the best thing to do with that is, is you look into this mirror right here. And it'll show you what you really are if you want to see it. But it'll also show you what you think you are if your heart is twisted. The Bible teaches you very clearly the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So you better make sure that when you go to it, Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing of the of the soul and spirit, and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So what he says there is, is that the, this book of all books knows your heart when you go to read it. So if your heart is twisted up, you know what you can come out with? You can come out with baptism saves you. You can come out with sacraments, save you. You can come out with hostile shantai, untai, a bow tie, economy Honda. You can come out with being slain in the spirit. You can come out with the handling snakes. You can come out with drinking poison. You can come out with anything you want to. You can come out with Seventh-day Adventists. You can say the mark of the beast is you gathering together on Sunday, which Paul says is the first day of the week for you and I. But the Seventh-day Adventists say that's the mark of the beast. So if you gather for church on Sunday, you're part of Roman Catholicism, and therefore you've accepted the mark of the beast, and so therefore you're all anathema, you're damned, you're going to hell. That's what they teach. That's why they meet on Saturday. You say, what is that? That's Old Testament stuff that has to do with Jews. It has nothing to do with you. But if your heart is twisted and you look into that thing, the next thing you know is it's always based on one thing, and I'll tell you what it is. It's based on man's own self-righteousness. 
Every, every other uh, religion that is founded is founded upon certain individuals that look upon themselves as the standard by which everybody should live. And so what they do is they formulate a religion around that. Uh, if you study Mormonism very long, you'll find out that uh, Joseph Smith studied a lot of uh, Muhammad's works and things like that, which he didn't write any of the stuff himself. He had all these other people writing for him. But at any rate, he studied a lot of that. He called himself the second Muhammad. You'd be surprised if you study that thing how much of that religion is based on the, the uh, re religion of Islam, Muslim religion. Now, what I want to show you is, is that you have a responsibility to see if you're bearing these fruits. You want to find out if you're a good Christian? It has nothing to do with how much you throw in the offering plate. You say, but preacher, we have, that's God's problem. That's not your problem. You have to worry about all that stuff. You're not driven by money. You're not driven by attendance, though I think it's important. I think those things are there, but they're not the marks of a Christian. Mormons are more faithful than most of you people. Catholics are more faithful than most of you people. Really, uh, us people, I'll say that. How's that? Yeah. Uh, I, know, uh, I know a lot of guys, I say a lot, I know a few guys that profess to be uh, uh, Muslims, and they're more faithful in their daily prayers than I am. Amen. They pray three and four times a day, and they never miss. Yep. And they read their Koran through time and time and time and time again. They're more faithful to their Bible reading than I am. Will that make him a Christian? No, you're a Christian, because you're, you're a saved person because you trust Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with what you do. Not of works. Amen. You don't go by works. Amen. And what causes problems in the church is, is that you're working and nobody else is, and it makes you mad. Well, I just think they ought to be here, and I think they ought to be doing this, and I think they should be doing that, and I think if they were a good Christian, they wouldn't. I think if you were a good Christian, you'd shut your cotton-picking mouth and put your tongue on the altar. Amen. Now, I, now... You, you think I'm kidding. Hold, you, just hang on, we'll go to Galatians. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Come to the book of James real quick. I'm, I'm ready to go this morning. I get, I get wore out with this stuff. You Christians, you get into fights and squabbles over things that don't matter at all. If the devil can get you fighting among yourself, you can't get nothing done for him. Who's doing what? How are they doing it? They're making a mess of it. All of us are. It's like this. It's like you, uh, you have, um, oh, let's say a coloring book. You've got a coloring book. And your kid sits down with the coloring book and colors all over the pages, man. I mean, all outside the line. And they paint the flesh green and they paint, you know, the other thing. The colors don't match. They paint this purple. They paint that, you know, chartreuse and all this other stuff. And you hang that thing on your refrigerator. And to you, it's a work of art. And somebody walks in there and says, what is that? You say, well, that's my kids. That's my grandkids. Look at that. Isn't that a blessed man? Look how good that is. And you're looking at it thinking, that's a train wreck, man. Are you kidding me? Look at that mess. Well, that's the whole thing that is with us. We're up there, and the Lord hangs us up there on the refrigerator door, and the angel comes by and says, what is that? And the Lord says, why, my, one of my kids did that. Isn't that a blessing? Look at that. And he said, angel says, my goodness, man. What are you kidding me? The Lord said, it looks great, doesn't it? And the angel says, are you seeing what I'm seeing? You have a clue. What are you looking at? The Lord says, I'm, I'm looking at the effort. I'm looking at the fact they tried. I'm looking at their... But none of us are doing it without making a mess. And whenever you get to the point where you think, well, I'm, I've got it under control. and Now everybody should be doing this and doing this and doing this and so on and so forth. You're whacked out. You're making a mess too. You just don't know it. You're coloring all outside the lines. When you get over there in Galatians, in Galatians he says this. He says, uh, who did hinder you? When you're talking about running the race, who hindered you? Most times we hinder ourselves because you run outside your lane. You know, and, or, or we broaden our lanes and we say it's our lane because it encompasses everybody. Listen, listen. You've got to understand that the biggest problem in the majority of churches today is is you thinking somebody else should be doing, saying, or being something that you think you already are. You'll always look at somebody who is not doing what you're doing because you think you're doing puts you in a position to judge the other person. You won't judge them based on, you know, well, I think they ought to be reading their Bible unless you're reading it all the time. But you'll judge them like on, say, oh, attendance if you're here all the time. Well, how come they're not here all the time? I don't know. Not my deal. My job's to be here. You see how you Christians get? Let me show you this thing about the, about the mouth. The Lord's real funny about that. I'll probably preach a sermon on it. 
Look at this in verse 26, James 1, 26. You have 12 tribes scattered abroad and all. Okay, well, we can make a, a practical application. You can't cut out all of James chapter number 3 talking about the tongue and all that other kind of stuff and being unable to hold it like a rudder and that kind of a deal. You can't cut that whole thing out because you're a gossiper. That's one of the things that Paul says you watch out for when you're being carnal. You're always talking about, why are you so interested in what everybody else is doing? Why don't you try to help them, support them, be an Aaron and a Herb, try to hold up their arms, say, hey man, you know, they're, at least they're trying, coloring outside the lines. Yeah, they are, but who hadn't? Be gracious with people. It's God's job to do that stuff. Amen. All right, look here in James chapter 1, look in verse uh, 26. If any man among you seem to be religious, uh, seem to be religious, looks good on the outside, right? Yeah. I mean, look, he got it right. I mean, he's still in church. He's got a shirt and tie on. He's got on the right kind of appropriate attire, whatever that is, whatever, whatever your interpretation of modest apparel is. I just go ahead and say this, and I know it's going out all over, but it ain't modest apparel to be out cutting your grass in a dress, lady. God bless you, you know, I just believe that's spiritual. Okay, well, be stupid the rest of your life then. I get so wore out with people trying to dictate or legislate to you what spirituality is. We had a lady who used to drive a UPS truck. She was all suffering all the time, but all had a difficult time because people gave her a hard time because she has to get in and out of a truck all day long. Had a good job working at that particular place, but the, the uniform was, uh, was uh, trousers and a, and a shirt. And they told her, the one guy told her, she came up to me and said, crying, bawling. She said, preacher, the fellow told me I should quit my job because I can't wear a skirt. And I said, well, tell him to feed your family then. Maybe he should marry you. Shoot your mouth off. You don't have to live with the repercussions of that. I don't understand that stuff. I don't understand why you think that's so... Spe- I, oh, I, I forgot. It's because you're wearing it. But you're bitter about having to wear it, aren't you? Yeah. You really don't want to. That's good. Amen. So you point at everybody else who is. Right. Amen. That's why some of you get hung up on somebody's attendance. Sure. You're bitter about having to be here and you want somebody else to take the whipping with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to understand this thing about spirituality has nothing to do with the outside. If you get the inside right, he must increase. Is that right? That means you decrease. Well, you know what happens? You get everything right on the outside. You strut around like a peacock and crow like a rooster and run around thinking you're something because you look in the mirror and say, don't I look spiritual? Well, look at this. The Bible happens to have a response to that. And the Bible says, if any man among you seem to be religious... Well, how about that? Looks religious to you. He must be religious. Look at him. How do you judge whether he's religious or not? Because he said he read his Bible or because he has a verse to quote to you or because he's got 50 bumper stickers on his car? You don't realize he's just covering up rust spots or trying to hold his car together. I don't care if you've got them. Don't go out of here and get offended by that. But I know how you people are. You people are that if you got 50, you're mad at somebody that ain't got one. Because you think, well, there are you, why are you bitter about it? God told you to plaster your car with them? Plaster your car with them. Don't make you more spiritual. Or because you, roll, you drive a rolling piece of junk. Maybe it's because you're lazy and don't work. Maybe you're working hard and can't afford more than that. What you drive doesn't determine if you're spiritual or not. I'm not the very idea. But if you've got your covetous at heart, that's your problem. You're envious over somebody that's got something and you don't. Oh, well, he must have compromised. That's like a fellow told me one time. He says, how many you got in your church? I said, I really don't know. We don't really keep up with numbers. But, you know, a couple hundred people, I guess. He goes, you can't have a church like that unless you're compromising somewhere. I said, okay. What are you going to say to that? I, it's okay. What are you, okay, I guess. <laughs> What's his determination? Well, his determination is, is that, well, spirituality is you got less than 50 people. Okay. I can't help that. I mean, it's not a marketing scheme. But look at this. He that seemeth religious. That ought to hit you right between the eyes. But watch. And bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. <laughs> so when I tell you that if you're talking about what everybody else is doing and you can't bridle your tongue, your religion's vain. You're too interested in everybody else's stuff. Come to Galatians 5. This has nothing to do with revelation at all, but it's something that needs to be had. I don't want to see our church get torn up by a bunch of stinking hypocrites 
that are always looking at what everybody else is or isn't doing. Amen. Some people might have been doing stuff before you ever even got in. I always like this. I call them flash in the pan. They, they get saved later on in life and stuff, and they get sold out for Jesus Christ, and they start really moving out, and you know they've been at it about five years, and they're looking at somebody who's been at it for 35 years, and they're saying, well, boy, aren't they lazy, and aren't they doing that? Come talk to me when you've been at it 35 years, sonny. There's something to be said for just being old-fashioned faithful. Just here, just here, just continuing to hang on and hang on and hang on and hang on. But when you're doing something, you're always upset at somebody that ain't. I'm preaching good this morning. <laughs> you can tell because I can tell you look constipated or something. Like, ah, ah. What are you so interested in that for? Why don't you pray for them? Why don't you get behind them? Why don't you spend so much time talking to the Lord as you do talking to each other or thumbing each other, man? That's what I'm calling it now. I call it the tongue and the thumb. Because you, you thumb each other, you know? You've got to, you know, you know, now so well, I don't really gossip with my mouth. Yeah, but you do with your thumbs. It's still words. That's a strange thing to me. We're talking about giving. We'll get back to that in just a second. But your giving doesn't determine anything. The Catholics send out a thing every year. I used to be at a church. They'd send out a thing every year. They'd ask you for put in your pledge, and you put in your pledge and how much it was. Well, what that is is, in a sense, they're saying, uh, if you vow to vow, it's better not to vow to vow than to vow to vow and not kept it. And you promised to give this amount of money, and so we're sending you a bill in the mail and saying to you, you know, you promised to give this amount, but you're, hey, you're behind on your quarterly dues, so to speak. I didn't join a club. <laughs> but sometimes life changes, doesn't it? But you promised to give so-and-so, that's why I don't do it. Now, this is going to upset. I, people are going to hear this. They're going to get upset. That's why I don't do that. We don't do the thing when it comes to missions called faith promise. Right. Right. To have you write a pledge on here. Well, give up your Cokes and your coffee and give up your te- television and give up your newspaper and give up anything in life so that you can support. Hey, hey, let me just tell you this. You do what God tells you to do, you'll be just fine. Amen. You don't make a pledge and put people in bondage. Bondage creates bitterness. Amen put up a thermometer and have you, you know, do this, do this, do this, so we can get to that. Let God take care of it. Now, what happens is, is you think that's a mark of spirituality, how much you're going to pledge. And then the church cuts out and says, we're going to give this much to missions. And now the pressure's on the people to up, come up with it. And, oh, what a blessing it is if you get it. Well, why don't y'all do that here? Because I think it's bondage. If you want to do that, then you can go join a place that does that. We support missions. We give our missionaries good money. But we ain't got 500 missionaries. You say, well, we can't afford it. Well, if you push the people to do it, would you ever just stop to think that maybe God don't want people pushed? I'll push you closer to Him. And let Him take care of the rest. But what happens is, if I push you to give more, you must be more spiritual. Right? Because you're giving sacrificially. You get close to Jesus, you know what will happen? Sooner or later, you'll turn loose of your wallet. But then what happens if life throws you a curveball? The kid winds up sick and you got hospital bills. Don't pay your hospital bills and don't worry about it. Really. Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5, verse 22. Here's spirituality, the fruit of the Spirit. That's something you can't do. How much of this you have in your life? Love, joy, peace, giving, dress codes, haircuts, <laughs> faithfulness and attention. Oh, I'm sorry, I must have had the wrong book there. It must have been our doctrinal statement or something. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. How much of that you got? Next third, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Long-suffering has to do with your treating how you treat other people. Gentleness, that's how you treat other people. Goodness, how you doing? Good Christian, are you? Still got a problem with that tongue? Well, your religion's vain. That's what the Bible says. No, I didn't say that. Well, I don't think it would be so sarcastic. Some of you are going to be in for the shock of your life when you kneel at the judgment seat of Christ and you hear how God talks to you. The Bible says when he talks, it sounds like Niagara Falls going off. They shudder. You know what happens when he comes down in the Old Testament? In the Old Testament, he comes down there. The people are gathered up around the mount, Mount Horeb there. They're all gathered around the bottom, and the Lord comes down there, and he speaks. You know what the people say? My God, Moses, he's too loud. We're going back to the house. You talk to him and tell him what, find out what he's saying, and you come tell us. You know what their complaint is? He's too loud. I'm not saying I'm God. 
But it's interesting how people are more interested in how something is said instead of what's said. You're so stinking thin-skinned that if I say something, it's like, oh, I think he meant that for me. I, don't, I just can't believe he said that to me. Yeah, there's 200 other, some, how many other people that are in here, and you think it was directed at you. Because you're the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral, and you think, you know, that everybody else can sit aside because he's just talking directly to me. I've seen it happen. I've seen people be here 15 years or so, and then all of a sudden one thing gets said, but because they get it twisted in their mind, they think, well, that's being aimed at me, and the next thing you know, I'm leaving. You're going to give up 15 years for what? Because of how something was said. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. You trust the Lord. That's trust in the Old Testament. You have faith in Him. He that hath begun a good work in you shall perform it. Is that right? Yes. Well, let's back up again and catch the rest of the, the whole verse. He that hath begun a good work in you, bless you, he shall perform it. You can't perform it for somebody. You can't perform it for yourself. He does it. If he don't do it, it ain't worth having. Okay, well, how are you doing there, good Christian? I walked in this morning looking where somebody's driving in the parking lot. Whether somebody's late or not. Whether somebody's dressed a certain way or not. Well, is the Lord working in them? Well, then why don't you let Him finish them? Folks, you know what people see when they walk in a house? They see the finished work. They don't see all the stuff under the ground. They don't see all the stuff to support. They don't, you know what they see? They see all the stuff that's ornate. The finished work, that's intricate detail. It takes time and effort. But that's the stuff people see. He that hath begun a good work in you shall perform it. Well, is he a liar? Well, how come they... Well, preacher, I just don't understand why they can't hurry up and get there. I mean, why can't they get there as quick as I got there? And, yeah, and the Lord's looking at you going, oh, man, you're a long ways. <laughs> you're so far behind, you think you're first. <laughs> You'll get that in a minute. <laughs> and the Lord, you're, you're out there running and saying, man, I'm, Lord, I'm so far out there in front of everybody, man. <laughs> I mean, there ain't nobody around me anywhere. And the Lord's like, yeah, that's because the rest of the crew done run off and left you. <laughs> you say, why? Because you're busy running your race looking at what everybody else is doing. You can't run that way. You trip and fall and bust your uh, head. Faith. Meekness. Temperance. Temperance. Self-control. It takes time to get that. All right, now come to 2 Corinthians. Can you give God time to work on people? I guess is what I'm trying to tell you. you, you, you what is your measuring stick? <clears throat> Can you listen to me for just a second? Can I tell you that invariably you as Bible believers will go outside the Bible or use the Bible to mirror yourself and therefore you yourself will become the measuring stick by which you judge everybody else? If you're giving, you know what you'll think? Anybody that doesn't give is not as, not as saved as you are, not, I mean not as uh, spiritual as you are. If God's finally convicted you about a certain way that you dress or a certain thing that you do, you'll think anybody that's not doing what you're doing is not as spiritual as you are. You yourself will become the measuring stick. Are you listening to me? This is important for you to get a hold of. Especially those of you that get to looking at everybody else and you start making benchmarks as to what you think spirituality is. And then you know what you do? You use that to cut other people down to make yourself look better. That's a dangerous thing. Amen. It'll tear your relationship with Jesus Christ up, first of all. It'll tear your family up, second of all. And it'll tear your church up, third of all. Amen. You've got to trust in the promises of God. Amen. Thank God they're saved. Okay, God's problem. That's it. Mm-hmm. You don't put them in your oven That's right. and determine when they're done. Amen. You'd be turning around all the time going, oh, I burnt that one up. <laughs> oh, well, I burnt that one the oven must have been a little too hot there, you know. But I could stand that heat, but they couldn't stand that heat and all that other kind of stuff. You'd be burning them up right and left, trying to live to you. Listen, listen, let God bring them along. He knows what's going on in their life and what's happening. I'm going to preach to you this morning a message about 
about seven or eight people in the Bible. It may take a little while to get through it. But I'm going to show you God working in their life. And if you were to look at different points and times in their life, you know what you'd say? There ain't no way God's going to use somebody like that. And they wind up being one of the heroes of the faith. You might be surprised what God will do with somebody today, right now, that you don't think God would ever use. Because you're looking at a little microcosm of their life right now and you're saying, well, they're not doing this and they're not doing this and they're not doing this. And it, Let's just be honest. You're bitter about having to do it yourself. <laughs> Aren't you? That's it. That's it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be so interested in everybody that ain't doing what you're doing. Amen. Uh, let's say, ladies, uh, let's say this. Let me think of something here. Okay, ladies, here's a good one for you. Can you turn the air conditioner on, please? It's hot. Maybe it's just me, but it's... Are, are anybody hot? Hallelujah, good. Now I'm supposed to ask if anybody's cold. I don't care if you're cold. I'm hot. For one time. Well, but some of us are just right. Okay, well, good. Right now I'm hot, you know, so... Uh, here's a good one for you, ladies. Now, now watch. Let's show you how fickle you are, okay? When you go shopping. You go Christmas shopping, or you go shopping for a new dress, or you go get, you know... You're sitting there in the chair getting your... Uh, Paul's done and your, you know, your nails and all that kind of... Are you looking around going, I wonder why they're not shopping. Well, everybody knows that they should be shopping. Why aren't they shopping? I don't know why they're not shopping. They should be having a mani-pedi right now. I don't know why she doesn't have her nails done. No, you don't do that, but you sure do it when it comes to church. Amen. Why is that? Well, I just, I just think that they should... No, you don't do it with things you like to do. I'm trying to say that you're bitter about doing what you're doing. You start coming to church, but you get bitter about coming to church, and you feel like you have to come to church because it's associated with your reputation. Right? The fact of the matter is you really don't want to be here, but you force yourself to come because you've got a little spiritual character or whatever, but the thing you do is you sit there and pick and choose everybody that ain't here. Because you think, you know what, the fact is you're mad about having to be here. Well, I'm here. Yeah, you don't do that. You get ready to go hunting. You climb up a tree stand. You know what you're hoping? I hope nobody else comes. I want the deer from me. Right? You go to tee it up out on the golf course. You're hoping there ain't nobody else there. You want it all to yourself. I wonder why everybody, they say they're a player. I wonder why they're not here. Right? But boy, when it comes to church... I think we just have a bunch of Christians that are bitter about having to serve God. That's the truth. It might be a hard truth, but man, what a, what a liberty when you finally realize God's going to do what He needs to do in them. That's God's problem. It ain't your problem, so quit having it on your plate. They need to be there. Okay, well, God knows it. The Holy Spirit can't convict them and convince them. What do you think you are? The fourth part of the Trinity? Put you up there with Joseph Smith or something. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. That's ridiculous. And that's where this thing gets into trouble in the New Testament. The same thing happens for you guys that go street preaching. Street preaching. You can turn around and you can listen. I'll, I'll, you can just well hear what I'm saying. He's going like this and he's like, whoa, what? <laughs> street preaching oftentimes tears up churches. You know why? Because the street preachers think they're more spiritual than the people that ain't street preaching. Hey, sonny boy, I got people around here that was preaching on the street before you were even saved. You ain't proving nothing. I got people that face bullets around here, and you're out there, you know, getting, getting one for the old gipper or something. You get, what happens is you think because you're doing it that you're more spiritual than those that ain't. Well, you're bitter about doing it. You guys in school, same thing. I'm in Bible school. How come he's not in Bible school? How come he's not called? To, maybe he ain't called to preach. Maybe he ain't called to be in Bible school. Maybe the truth of the matter is you're bitter about being there and you really don't even know that you should be there or you were ever called in the first place, but you ain't man enough to back off and say, I don't think that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Maybe it changed. Maybe God needs to do that for you, but maybe you don't need to do it for everybody else. Well, I just think you ought to pack up and go to Bible school. Really? Well, you better let God decide that. You're getting quiet on me now. I was going to get into Revelation here, but I've about shot my 45 minutes here. But, but ladies and gentlemen, you get to making benchmarks when it comes to this stuff. You're, you're headed, your church, your church, this your church, is headed for trouble. 
You better watch that stuff. You're saved. Now you're in God's hands. Now can you let God deal with them? You know what God does sometimes? God surrounds you with individuals that are, that are not doing things the way you do them just to irritate you, work on you with sandpaper, Amen. just to grind the edges off of you. You say, why? Sooner or later, the Lord's going to teach you to put on blinders and realize, you know what? The guy I'm looking at in the mirror every day is giving me enough trouble. I better Amen. just worry about keeping up with him. Quit worrying about everybody else. Amen. Some of you people, you, you can't stand it. You've got green eyes. You, you, can't, you, you can't stand it when God uses somebody else to deal with somebody and it's not using you. Maybe God's doing that for a reason. Maybe God's doing that for a reason. You couldn't be the problem, could you? No, it wouldn't be you. Something's wrong with them. You're quiet. You ever seen individuals who always want to counsel everybody on what to do and how they should do? And you know, they always you hear you hear them get involved in everybody's life and everybody's problem and everybody's stuff going on in their life. And well, let me just tell you, if it was me, I would do this, and if it was me, I would do that. Well, what did you just say? If it was you, now here's how they do it. You want me to show you spiritually how they do it? Well, I just believe God would have you to do it this way. Here's a good one for you. Well, God told me. Okay. <laughs> See you later. God told you. Well, how come he didn't tell me in the Bible? How come he didn't tell me through the preaching of the Bible? God told you. Really. You back in the Old Testament now where you're speaking through prophets and stuff? Funny how they invoke that. A fellow came to me one time and he said, God told me that I'm supposed to come here. And I said, okay. He said, what do you think about that? And I said, I don't know. He said, God told you, so. And he came here, and then he said, God told me you were going to give me a bus. And I said, okay. I wanted to say, I think you're God smoking crack, but it didn't create I, You know what I said to him, though? Really, I, I was trying to be nice. I said, he would moved here from out west. And I said, okay, well, fill up your car first, and we'll talk about something else. Fill up my car. And I said, yeah, bring them in your car first. He packed up and went across the river and said, this is they're going to give him a bus over there. Okay, fine. He said, why don't you have buses? The Lord ain't never led us that way. Amen. I mean, what, 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 can I ask you this question? For some of you, have such a hard time with this stuff. Well, preacher, you know, we've got to go out there and get them. You've got buses crossing everybody's lines all across here. Buses running from this, buses running here, buses running here, buses running here, bringing all the bus people, the bus people, the bus people, the bus people. Then go join a church that has a bus ministry. And you do and bust them out of this place and bust them over to that place and bust them at your church not ready for a bus ministry, maybe. I don't know. If you have it, that's wonderful. It's great. Fine. But it doesn't mean you're spiritual if you do or you don't have it. Amen. God calls you to a bus ministry, get it. That's why sometimes people put pressure. They say, well, preacher, I, you know, you need to have this program or you need to have that program. You need to do this. You need that. For years, 20-something years. Somebody comes in and says, well, now I'm here. This is what I think you ought to do. Okay, well, go, why don't you go do it? But it's spiritual because the church I came from did. What does that make? All right, now to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Is this making any sense to you at all? The, the, the danger of this thing is, is, is that anything that creates bondage, you understand? Anything that creates bondage is not biblical. The Lord said in Isaiah 61, He came to set the captives free. Amen. You're supposed to be a servant, not a slave. Amen. You're not forced into anything. You're saved by grace through faith. A free gift, right? right. Is that right? Amen. Folks in the balcony, is that right? All right. It doesn't change after that. It has to do with your willingness. But everybody is as different spiritually as a snowflake. We have salvation in common. But after that, all of us have different personalities and all of us have different parts in the body. 2 Corinthians tells you very clearly in the Bible in chapter 12 that some are hands and some are feet and some are eyes and some are noses and some are ears and that kind of a thing. The danger becomes when you try to get the hand to support the weight that the foot does. It's not developed or meant to be a foot. Or you try to get an eye to be an ear, it's not capable of doing it. That leads to frustration and it leads to bondage because they're, they're not... Listen, you've got to learn to do what the Lord tells you to do because He's the only one that knows what you're made to do. 
Well, I think you ought to sing a song. Okay, why do you think I should sing a song? God's never told me to sing a song. Right. We have a wonderful voice. You should be singing a song. Okay, well, I think the Lord wants me to sing a song. I can sing a song. I'm not saying I have a wonderful voice. I'm just saying, well, I think you should work on your musical ability. But for me, I'm a preacher, and I'm perfectly satisfied being a preacher. I'm not an entertainer. I don't want to be a singer. I don't want to learn to play. The, I wish I had learned to play the piano, but I... Too late for me now. If you're a singer, praise the Lord for you. I'm glad you are. We've got good singers here. But the worst thing in the world is to have a singer trying to be a preacher or a preacher trying to be a singer. You get frustrated that way. You're trying to be something you ain't called to do. You're an organizer. Good. You're going to suffer the agony of the damned, especially in the, in, in the, in the uh, time period we live in now. You say, Why? Because people are more disorganized now with all the products and stuff they got going around than they've ever been. They're going to irritate you to no end. That's why sometimes, lady, you marry a slob. Because you overdo it when it comes to being too neat, and he overdoes it when it comes to being sloppy, or vice versa. I've seen men that way. I've seen women that are pigs. All women are not neat freaks. Really. Really. I'm not being mean to you. <laughs> Sorry, TK, I didn't mean to offend you. <laughs> Robin said, you can go and get up out of here. I don't care. <laughs> <coughs> All right, now 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. Here is the rule. Preacher, I'm not under the law. I'm not going to put you back under the law. I know tithing was there before the law. I know it's under grace. But I'm not using tithing as a measuring stick to put you in shackles. Notice the Bible says, verse number 5, Therefore thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof you had noticed before, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as covetousness. Isn't that interesting he puts it on there? Notice he mentions boasting and that kind of a thing in the passage. Now watch this, verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Paul's not trying to get an offering out of them. Paul's not trying to say, if you're spiritual, he's not trying to give them a promise and say he's just simply giving them a statement of fact. But he doesn't promise you that those blessings are going to be material blessings. And he doesn't promise you that those blessings are going to be for the here and now. That's where you can get bitter. Well, I threw in a hundred and I didn't get my thousand back. Pressed down, shaken together twice, turned over on the oven or whatever it might be and handed it back to me. They promise you that to give you something to hook you, like the lottery. Give us your however much it is, the money you pay for the thing, and you know you have the, the potential to get money back. People never complain about the lottery, but they complain about every time they throw money in the place. Well, God didn't give it back to me. Really? How do you know he didn't? That's right. Why do you think you're still married? Amen. 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 Why do you think your kid doesn't have a disease? Amen. Why do you think you got a job? Amen. Why do you think you can still see? Amen. Why do you think you recovered from a disease? Amen. You think you're paying for that? It's just how you look at the blessings. Sure. Now, he's just saying, you're so, that, that's a... That's a Known fact, you go out and sow an acre of land or ten acres, which one's going to give you the most, pro- give you the most uh, 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 product? Sure. The ten acres, right? right? It's just a principle, that's sure. all. On, He's not saying, no, you've got to give, you've got to give, you've got to give, you've got to give. You know what the Lord does? He looks at a woman down there who gives two mites. It has nothing to do with a mount. And he said, man, look at that lady. She dumped it in there, man. Look at that. Ain't that really something? And the guy said, what are you talking about, man? It wasn't two mites. That guy went in there and throw a roll of the dollars in there to choke a horse. And the Lord said, yeah, that wasn't nothing to him. But that was something to that lady. Amen. Amen. God's watching that stuff. Amen. Why are you so interested in it? Now watch what Paul does because Paul's very careful and the, through the Holy Spirit, he knows human nature. Sure. Every man, singularly, According as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Not what everybody else is doing, not whatever. What's the Lord put on your heart? Well, I got a clear conscience from preacher about not giving anything. Okay. I, I can't, how, can I, how can I say that can't be true? Isn't that what it says? 
Well, how can you go contrary to the Bible? Well, I just believe if you're a good Christian, you'll be a giver. Okay, well, maybe they're giving their time. Maybe they're giving their talent. Maybe right now they're give out. How do you know? You don't know. But if you're doing it, you're looking at somebody who's not because you're bitter about doing it. You gave it grudgingly in the first place. You're worried about it. Just, just, just got, you're, just, you're just infatuated with it. Just, just, I, I, well, what's, what, 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 hey, when you turn it loose to the Lord, if you've turned it loose, you're done. It's that, ah, but, 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 but why isn't he? But, but I've never seen him put anything in the offering plate, one fellow told me. I've never seen him drop a dime in the offering plate. And I happened to be sitting at a meal one time when the treasurer said to the other fellow, he said, you know something, preacher? It was at a meeting. He said, you know something, preacher? He said, we're having a lot of people that are sending in these, uh, these, these prepaid uh, um, uh, check things or whatever you get, you know, through the mail. And they just type it into their deal and it just comes to the church in the mail. And they don't put it in the offering plate. You know what the guy who's throwing it in the offering plate is saying? I don't ever see them put nothing in the offering plate. Boy, I was so tempted to say, hey, preacher, why don't you pull that guy's tithe? <laughs> I wouldn't do that, but I thought about it. How do you know? What, what, what difference does it make? God giving you an opportunity to get in on something? Why do you care what everybody else gets in on it or not? Amen. What difference does it make? Mary, you know what she does? She comes in there with the bottle, right? She breaks the bottle and everybody's like, Oh, well, good night. Why didn't you give that to the poor? She didn't turn around and look at all the other guys and say, Hey, what are you giving? But they sure were interested in what she was giving. Amen. What's the matter, boys? Y'all a little bitter? What's the matter, Christian? You a little bitter? plate comes by, you feel guilty about it, well then put something in it. <laughs> plate comes by, it don't bother you at all, why are you worried about it? Maybe they send it in through the mail. Maybe they don't send nothing in. Say, how much do they? I don't know. You could ask him, he ain't going to tell you. I don't know what they do. But my, my, my statement to you is this, why are you so interested in it? Amen. It's interesting, that's just crazy stuff. All right, now watch. Every man as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. Independent Baptist slant on, slant on it. Now the Bible says you should give, and the Bible says that you should give, not grudgingly or of necessity, but you should give cheerfully, because God. if you want God to love you, then give cheerfully. But by all means, give. Really. So now I'm giving because I'm wanting Him to love me? That's not what he's saying. You're not buying his love because, oh Lord, I'm, I'm happy. I wonder if anybody else is doing that. I didn't mean to give the whole thing. Can I have a little bit of that back, please? Uh, uh, I mean, a little bit was okay, but it kind of just came out and... And then the plate goes by and somebody drops in some dimes and somebody drops in some pennies and somebody drops in a dollar or two and you're thinking, well, what? if they're not going to give any more than that, why should I be giving so much? My, 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 my. Yeah. Now, why does he tell you not grudgingly and not of necessity? That's right. Amen. Because your giving is to be simply like the Lord did on Calvary. Amen. Your giving is a representative of that. I'm willing the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he set his face like a flint. Right? Set his face like a flint for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Right? Would you agree that he was willing when he went? Amen. Would you agree that he was not grudging when he went? Amen. Would you agree that it was, he didn't have to do it of necessity? Amen. Why did he do it? Okay, so if you want to do something fine, the Lord, does, he's not impressed at all with it when you, you give it and you don't want to give it. Or you give it and you think, well, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. I, I'm just going to have to, to trust God. I'm not going to put you in that bondage. <clears throat> I hate to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. I wish I could tell you otherwise. But if you haven't heard nothing else I've said this morning, I wish you could hear this. I've known people that have given everything they've got and lost everything they had. 
I've known people that have given everything and their kids are sick. I've known people that have given everything. They've lost children. I've known people that have given everything that have had divorces in their lives. They've lost everything they got. It is not a monetary thing he's talking about. And there's no insurance against your tires not blowing out and your water heater not blowing up. I wish I could tell you otherwise. Well, if you just give, you know, like the fellow said that time, I think I told you last week. Well, you know, if you, if, if you don't give, then God will blow up your car. He'll get his tithe out of you one way or another. That's right out of the pit of hell. That's somebody putting you up in one of these arm bars and walking you to the car on your tiptoes, you know, telling you, you better do this or I'm going to, you know. No, sir, man. You don't work that way. You throw it in the plate and say, here, Lord. Appreciate it. You want it back? No. Did you have to do it? No, I didn't have to. He gave me a chance to. I wanted to. Can you believe that? I dumped it. Preacher, why don't you have one of them giving days where everybody gives all and all that kind of... It's a sham. It's a game. Amen. It's like gambling. Yeah. You know, I'm going to put all that in there and then see what God does for me. Well, you know, I, I, I tithe. I can't afford not to. So, did you, do you hear what you just said? Right. If I don't, God's going to knock the tar out of me. What kind of relationship you got with God? Right. I believe in giving. I really do. It's my own personal conviction. How much of your income do you give? That's none of your business. My, I give what I believe the Lord wants me to give. Amen. Well, you know, you should set the standard and all that. What am I going to do? Get up here and post my tithing record for you all to see that I, I, pre, I believe what I preach? That's foolishness. Yes, you know what you do? You, it's your own personal conviction. Some of you, don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't convict you right now. Maybe you're not at that point. doesn't mean you're not saved. doesn't mean you're not a good Christian. Which means right now, you've got other things going on. The Lord may deal with you, he may not. I don't know. God deals with me about that stuff a certain way. And sometimes it goes in waves. Sometimes for me, he's like, I'll take that. Okay. It's a matter of faith. You trust me? Yeah, okay. I'll take it. <laughs> sometimes it's just like, he don't say nothing. God doesn't speak like that to me and come down to me in heaven and go, from heaven and go, Good morning, David. Don't forget your tithe check this morning. He don't do that. Sometimes the Lord's just like, you know, doesn't say anything about it. I write out a check, get ready to dump it in the plate when the plate's passed and all that other kind of stuff, and the Lord hadn't said one thing about it one way or the other. I feel like the Lord wants me to do it, so I just do it. He don't tell me every single time. He don't tell me every time to read my Bible. He don't tell me every time to pray. He don't tell me every time to get up and come to church, even though I am the pastor. He doesn't tell me that stuff. Just some things, I guess he just figures that's between me and him. Figures that I, my wife doesn't ask me to come home every night. Some of you think that's how it is with the Lord. It's like, well, he didn't, he didn't ask me. Well, there's some things that are, go without saying, don't they? My wife doesn't say every time I walk out the door in the morning, are you coming back tonight? Really? But some of you think that's how God is. Well, God hadn't spoke to me about it. You ever thought this? Maybe God expects some things to be on automatic pilot. Yes, I really hope that helps you. I really do. I, I hope and pray it will set you free from that, from that foolishness. Uh, God helping me, uh, I'm not going to put you in that kind of bondage. <clears throat> God helping me. Um, you know, you got, you got your own struggles and stuff like that. Don't worry about it. God will take care of the other stuff. Okay, let's, let's pray quick. Father, thank you for your many blessings and thank you for the service this morning. Pray you'll be with us in the upcoming service. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, Brother Brad's going to